Rub up your engines! What do you think you're getting ripped off if you get your car fixed at the dealer? Guess what? The tractor owners do too. It turns out that uh, a few years ago, John Deere promised the farmers that it would make tractors easier to repair and they could get all the information. The reason they said that was because they were trying to get the Right to Repair Act, just like they recently passed in Massachusetts, so that private mechanics can get all the information and you as an owner can get the information to have your car fixed and the dealers can't hide all that information. They actually passed the bill there. Well, the John Deere tractor manufacturers they all decided hey uh, we don't want to have that right to repair bill for the farmers pass so well don't worry we'll give you that information well guess what they vowed that by January 1st 2021 that deer would make repair tool software and diagnostics available to the masses but they haven't <laughs> they just lied this is why these have to be forced these companies have to be forced to do it because they'll promise they'll do something then they don't well <laughs> well we promise well, you know, promises can be broken. And it got so bad that some of the John Deere tractor owners, they were fixed with software that was hacked uh, from the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians got the software and cracked it. I mean, that's been going on for ages in the automotive industry too. When a company like Mercedes, they want you to buy one of their $20,000 up scan tools to work on their cars. Well, the Chinese would just reverse engineer them and sold them to the world. Nobody's even going to care one way or another with that. I had bought one of those years ago from an American company. Company. It was a tool company, and I bought the scan tool from the American tool company, paid the tax and everything on it. It was made in China, but it was sold in the United States to an American tool company, and I used it to work on Mercedes Benzes because I was going to spend 25 grand for that fancy machine. And I got the information. It only cost me like $1,800 to buy the machine. And the farmers were doing the same thing. They were getting it from the Ukrainians. And of course, John Deere whined about it, and they said they were going to give the information out, but they didn't. Now, the farmers have been waiting three years, and to quote the farmer, we waited for this information and now we see it's not even a half measure you can't get this information and of course these companies in this case John Deere they come up with the lamest of excuses here's their quote we can't allow farmers to access the computer system at this level because it's a security risk okay come on now we've heard that enough from the government you can't learn that that's a security risk that's top secret what a load of baloney these are farmers that are trying to farm and get us food right and they're being ripped off by the company who says, well, we're the only ones that have the information to fix it. Now, of course, the farm machinery is even worse than cars. One of these farm implements has 136 of these separate modules in it. 136. That's even worse than a Mercedes-Benz. Just, you know, another thing of greed. And the company's lying to people. Said, oh, yeah, we will in three years. Three years later, they haven't. And now they say, oh, it's a security risk, you know. It is just absurd when they get involved in this stuff. And the poor farmers, they're stuck in the middle. There was one guy that he couldn't fix it himself, so he had to tow the thing to Don Deere. And he said, well, now they only charged me 800 bucks to fix it, but it was just a sensor that wasn't that hard to replace. He could have easily replaced himself if he knew what it was, but the time that he lost bringing it back and forth, he said it really cost him $8,000 for the lost time that he used harvesting and planting, whatever he was using it for, right? Time is money in any kind of business. So it's just, you know, another symptom of greedy companies ripping everybody off. And then they have lawyers hiding behind the scenes saying, well, that's a security risk. We can't give you that information. <laughs> I thought the farmers would have it better than we do, but no, they're even worse. They have more sensors and the companies won't get their information out. And it's not like there's that many farmers to complain. If millions of us as consumers complain to the manufacturers and the politicians as they are, since they're just like wheat in the field, when the wind blows, they bend. If people complain enough, they'll bend and they'll pass these right to repair laws. The farmers don't have enough power because there aren't enough of them. So they get ripped off by the people who build the machines. I-007 says, Scotty, I'm interested in buying a pre-owned pickup truck. What do you think of a GMC Sierra, two-wheel, four-wheel drive, 2000 to 2006, or would you recommend a first-generation Tundra? By the way, I'm not going to use it that much. I work three miles from my house, and I don't need it for home projects. Well, of course, for a long life. I would say get a Toyota Tundra. There's no arguing that. But you're not going to find a Tundra cheap because they hold their resale value even when they're old and have two, three hundred thousand miles on. Now, I'm not a GMC fan, but 
if you're talking about a 2000 Sierra first generation, those were pretty good vehicles. People around here in Tennessee that have them, they're still running like clocks. And you're going to get a used Sierra so much cheaper than a used Tundra. And if you only drive three miles to work and you're only going to be using this thing for projects, what the heck? I'd say you might look for a good used Sierra that you can get dirt cheap compared to the Tundra because you will never get a dirt cheap Tundra. Now, if you only wanted to buy a vehicle to run the rest of your life with that small mileage, get the Tundra and never think about it again. But if you want to save some money, you might get it. The old 2000 Sierras are much better than they're making them today. And if you're only driving at a few miles a year, what the heck? You get one. A mechanic says, yeah, it's in pretty good shape now. Why not? Because you're never going to get a cheap Tundra. Unless, I don't know, you go to an estate sale and you beat everybody else to it because as soon as people see there's a Tundra for sale, they're going to flock to buy it. Brian Walnut says, Scott, I got a 1998 Toyota Tacoma four-cylinder automatic, 198,000 miles. When my transmission shifts, it shifts fine, but once I get past 60, it won't go into overdrive. It goes up high, but it won't shift. I touch my foot to the floor and nothing, but it does downshift perfectly. Fluid and filter are new, and it shifts perfect in city traffic. All right, well, what's happening is your overdrive's not working. Now, it is electronically controlled. Make sure that that's working correctly. If the light comes on, you push the overdrive button that's on, you turn it off, then you'll see the OG off button. See if that works. If that doesn't work, maybe it just blew a fuse. Now, if that's all okay, you're going to have to take it to a mechanic like me. They'll run some scan tests, and you want to pray that the actual overdrive unit in a transmission isn't broken, because if it is, just live with it, because you would have to rebuild the entire transmission for that, and that's a really expensive job. But otherwise, if you just get a little bit worse gas mileage at highway speeds, I would just personally live with it with it. But it could be something electric, a fuse, the switch, could be lots of stuff. You want to pray it's not inside the transmission. Now, this may not be car related, but it's engine related. Turns out that Toro has issued a recall for some of their snow blowers because they have a risk of amputation. And of course, that's not in the warning. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't expect to be used as an amputation device just for blowing snow. Turns out that the things won't turn off right. You turn them off, the blades are supposed to stop spinning, and they won't stop spinning. 6,700 of these, these Toro Power Max 826 snow throwers with the model number 37802 are going to be recalled. So if you got one, be real careful around <laughs> It might not turn itself off, so don't get near the blades while they're spinning. If you have one of these snowblowers with the number 37802 model, you might just make sure the thing is shut off entirely before you get near it. You can hear if it's turned off. Now, they're saying you disengage the blade, it still spins. Okay, but if you turn the motor off, it's going to stop spinning. So instead of disengaging it, my advice is when you're done, turn the motor off. Then it's not going to chop any arms off because the motor's turned off and nothing's going to be spinning. Spinning. Should you put your wipers up or keep them down when it snows? I usually put them up so they don't freeze. Well, yes, it's a good idea to put them up before they freeze because here's the problem. When you have them down, most modern cars, they slide and hide down under the window. So even when you put your defrost on, it'll melt the ice on the window, but not below. They're still stuck. And if you turn them on, even though your windshield's melted, if the wipers are still frozen under the windshield, it can burn your motor out and it's going to be a real cow thawing it out. So Oh, it's a good idea to leave them up. It's a very smart idea. And if you really plan ahead, leave them up and put cardboard on the windshield first, because then when you heat it up, the cardboard will come off easy and it'll be a lot easier getting the ice off. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Most smart people will. They'll pick them up and then they don't get frozen. You can't burn the motors out. And it makes cleaning the whole thing a lot easier. You scrape in the windows, they're fine. But if your wipers are in the way and they're frozen on, you can break them scraping. When they're not touching the windshield, you can scrape the glass with the plastic and you won't hurt anything. Smart people do that. I know people all around here in Tennessee, they all got them flipped up when there's a storm coming overnight. Jazzy Josh says, I put in 25 years with the fire department in New York, and I'm ready to buy a car to find a nice place in Tennessee to try my stand at homesteading and unregulated and flood-free Tennessee land. Any suggestions? Yeah, do it as fast as you can. You want to get a car that lasts forever, you know, get a Corolla or a Camry. The Camrys are much more luxurious. They can last forever, and it's great here because this is pretty rocky land, a lot of limestone. It does and flood. I'm on the top of a hill. So when it rains, all the water does is go downhill. Now, big flood years ago in Nashville when the Cumberland went over, I'm like 145 feet above the Cumberland River. <laughs> and when it flooded, I think maybe it went up 40 feet, 45 feet, but I'm 145 feet. So downtown Nashville flooded and I still had another, you know, 100 feet to go. So it's not going to rain that much. It's a man of being on top. Oh, water runs downhill, right? <laughs>
And there's lots of land in Tennessee. I like even better in Texas. There's less taxes here than there was in Texas. So you coming from New York to here, you'll be living in dreamland. Let me tell you, the people are friendly. I met a guy from New York the other day. He moved down here 15 years ago. He said it was the smartest thing he ever did. <laughs> and you'll have your retirement and you can live like a king here in Tennessee on that kind of money. New York City, you're probably living like a pauper on your retirement here. You can live like a king. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.